No. I'll just have no, a quick... we're back. Um, we had a not chance to have a coffee. Poor Mikhail didn't. He went back to his car to warm up slightly. But um, we're back in, in, in Volgograd, back in Stalingrad. So just before we start off talking about the subject of this show, we're going to recap on a couple of things um, from the previous show. So one of the things Mikhail wanted to mention is inside buildings like the flour mill, the Russian soldiers cut what we'd call it mouse holes in, in British Army terminology to move between the rooms. He's got a couple of photos of them. So I'm going to just show them to you now. These, uh, this is Mikhail crawling through some of the, the, the holes they, they cut in there. And this is all so they can maneuver between different rooms and floors. That's one there inside there. And I'll ask Mikhail to explain how he got the opportunity to go in there. So Mikhail, how, how did you get the opportunity to go inside the building? Uh, I've been there once uh, with an American professor who was going to write a book about the uh, buildings of Stalingrad uh, and uh, uh, so about uh, the strategics of the Russian uh, soldiers, uh, how they defended of Staling uh, Stalingrad. So, uh, yeah, so we we were able to uh, walk by the all... Uh, uh, floors, uh, you uh, you can find them on my YouTube channel. It's uh, uh, Stalingrad Online. Uh, there are some of the videos uh, where we discover floor by floor, staircase by staircase, and uh, uh, where you can find more detailed uh, videos of this uh, uh, flour mill inside. Yeah, the, the uh, link to Mikhail's website is in the description below, folks. So, and the other question we got uh, from David Duffy, one of my friends in Ireland, is about the casualties the 13th Guard suffered crossing the river. So we were just having that conversation before we went online, mm -hmm. but it's several hundred, isn't it? Several hundred lost, killed and wounded just getting across. So Yeah, it's yeah, definitely several hundred, about uh, 600. Uh, I think uh, they lost... Uh, Oh, and uh, they're still on the, uh, on the bottom of the Volga River. So because uh, uh, very often uh, uh, the Russian, uh, uh, yeah, they provide different works uh, on the bottom of the Volga River and they find uh, even uh, human uh, remains and uh, ammunition like helmets, uh, weapons, uh, yeah, rusted, uh, 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 yeah. Machine yeah. guns and so on. Yeah. So I'll bring in Paul now. So Paul, where, where is Mikhail heading to now? We're going to the, the square. So um, to explain a bit more, taking up from where we went in the first show of the fighting. So you're getting a little bit further away from the river now, aren't we? We're another couple of blocks away from the river. Yeah. It's just, the front line, isn't it now? Again, just a few hundred yards. And the, the building you can see behind the artillery piece um, with the red brick, it's, it's now modern... Uh, apartment building but that's actually the location of Pavlov's house which is gonna which is our uh, uh, our theme for this part of the show um, so again you that yeah, straight back this one shows the mill uh, and shows that Pavlov's house was basically uh, part of two buildings that were effectively facing west uh, uh, west to east east to west whichever way you want to go um, so the far end of Pavlov's house was obviously far, uh, towards the tramway and it, through the square, which is where the front line was. The Germans were just on the other side of the square and in some of the buildings actually around the square itself. But on the map also, you can also see the, uh, the indication of some of the trenches that have been dug from the embankment into the mill, uh, from the mill into the real workers' house and then forward to actually in Pavlov's house. The uh, Russian engineers dug some... Uh, uh, trenches, tunnels, if you like, to link all these buildings together. Because as, uh, uh, as Mikhail was showing in the buildings, uh, the mouse holes to get from one section to another safely. Of course, the whole city was riddled with trenches and tunnels so that troops could try and move about without being taken down by snipers and uh, mortar fire. Etc. So yeah, and, and strategically for the for the viewers, the, the the reason this 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 area is so important is it's in the kind of converging of the roads that head down towards the Volga. Is the Germans yeah. want to get back the river and and and, and affect the Russian crossings and the, and the bringing of course the river. Yeah, that's right. Yes, they've got to get it's, past it's, uh, this kind of building. It's like in the blo a blocking position, isn't it? Essentially. Yes. Yeah. Basically, it is the blocking position. Capturing these buildings was vital. Um, to holding the Germans away from 
the actual embankment. And obviously, the further the Russians could have put into the city, the, for, the, best, the better it was for them. Problem was, of course, they were having to move troops in, using the crossings behind or the, the river banks and the embankment behind the mill and further into the city centre to move in other troops. But as the Germans were um, beginning to tactically move into no other areas as the fighting went on in September, uh, particularly moving northwards to try and capture the famous Mamiev Kurgan, uh, the, the uh, Hill 102, uh, and the, the, the southern parts of the factory districts. So the German emphasis, the German focus was beginning to move further north, but it was yeah. vital to hold these areas because um, you had a crossing point there, that's pretty cool. You had a crossing point also in the uh, rear of the Red October, the Kasny Octor, Akiyabe factory. Um, but the, uh, there were still troops being fed into this area who were moving up. You can see the uh, Lazur uh, chemicals, the factory, the Metis factory. Um, so the, the Russians were feeding troops in to basically hold that front line that existed right up the, uh, up the bank of the Volga. So very, very essentially, although, sorry to interrupt you again, it, although we're talking about a river, not an ocean, it's essentially like a beachhead. It's like, it's like yes, Anzio, yes, it's yes, like Normandy. Yes. The, the, more, the more ground the Russians can held, hold on the bank, the more reinforcements they can bring in, the more they yeah. can bring in heavy weaponry. So it's about establishing a beachhead. But in, in this kind of urban environment, and you can understand now why a single apartment building can become incredibly important because of, of, of oh, domination. So, yeah. yeah. Well, is it the Pavlos house? Is uh, Mikhail? Are we, are, are we going to do uh, Pavlos house? Yeah, the head, sorry, uh, sorry, Mikhail. Head head back towards the house again. I don't, I'm not sure where Mikhail's gone there. Yeah, he's yeah, he's just he's there. Yeah, he's, he's there. just gone up through the uh, the the sort of little park that's in between the houses. So, it's a little park for all the uh, all the residents. Yeah. So there's a cracking photo of that building there with, with Pavlov himself. So I guess it's a yes. good point now to start talking about the, the history of who Pavlov is and exactly what happened. And Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it sort of, in, in some ways, the, the, the story of Pavlov's house is, is, is the story of uh, the heroism of numerous buildings and numerous uh, Russian soldiers throughout yeah. the, the whole of the battle. But effectively, just a little bit of history about it, it's... Um, 22nd of September. So the main German assault in this area came in on the 14th, together with the, air, the, the assault by the 71st Division further to the uh, south in, the, in the, the actual central square area, the red square area. So on the 22nd, basically the, the German troops that came into the city were, were supported by Sturmgeschutz. The, uh, the, the German assault gun, there were two brigades, the 244, 245 brigade was supporting the, uh, the infantry division. 245 was actually supporting the German infantry here. Um, on the 22nd, the Germans managed to capture the area that we're going to go into, that Mikhail was heading to, uh, around the actual square itself. Great accounts from some of the infantry soldiers about how they had to force their way into the buildings around the square using flamethrowers, satchel charges, grenades, um, machine pistols. This was all very close quarter work. Um, and they basically had to blast the Russians out of the buildings. But what that meant was obviously that the Germans were finally beginning to put the, the Russians and, and the actual Bulgar and Panther there was under threat. Um, that day, the actual 13th Guards Rank Division reported that they knocked out 43 German tanks during this fighting. But of course, that, there was actually no German tanks there. There were Sturmgeschutz sand. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, with, with you know, we've, we've done the sort of claims thing before, Paul. The, uh, the actual claims, if you look at the, the losses for Sturmgeschutz Brigade 245, it was about roughly about five Sturmgeschutz knocked out. But they were the only support gun being attacked. You know, if, if a Sturmgeschutz is coming down the road, you might have one guy lobbing out a Molotov cocktail, another guy fires it with a machine, another guy throws a grenade at it. Yeah. So they all claim they got it. Uh, it's it's one vehicle, but it gets counted five or six times. It's it's a it's a common occurrence in in the recording of these kind of actions, especially yeah, exactly. in this kind of exactly. confused environment. So, yeah. So, anyway, so the, uh, the the sort of fighting there. Um, the, uh, to be fair, the German divisions were absolutely worn out, um, and that was the Abgefkampf was the actual German phrase. Seven infantry battalions of this division. 
Uh, a number of them were completely worn out, and a number of them were weak and basically only only uh, capable of defensive operations. But they were the only troops available. So the front went a little bit static. But as the Germans were now focusing slightly further north, Chirikov ordered Rodimsev to actually recapture some of the buildings around 9th of January Square. Uh, and uh, they'd, all, they'd actually fed in the, the famous 284 rifle division, Batyuk Siberians, which included Zaitsev, the, uh, the famous sniper. And yeah. they'd moved north of this location up towards the, uh, the factory district. But so Pavlov, uh, uh, gave uh, obviously orders to uh, the regimental commander in that area that Pavlov, uh, basically Don Pavlov, have Pavlov's house. Pavlov's I believe house Mikhail, isn't it? Time, I think yeah. that's translated correctly, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. We'll bring yeah. Mikhail in a minute. And Mikhail is heading, you know, through this. You can see it. And, and, and we, should, we didn't stress it in the first show, but... But us Westerners have an image of, of Stalingrad as being that ruin the city. But actually, before the war, it was a very prosperous, oh, yeah, industri very industrialized, yeah. Yeah. Um, city. sophisticated yeah. city, wasn't it? It was one of yeah. the Russia's sort of flagship cities. And, 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 and it has become that type of city again now. It's quite prosperous. There's lots of industry. And, and um, so, you know, we have this image of it in destruction. That is, of course, an, an epic part of its story. But it is in its own right. A very thriving city, as you can see by the yeah, parks. And yeah, I must admit, when I first went in two thousand and one, um, the the city was was fairly dilapidated in those days. It, it certainly needed some investment in the infrastructure and rebuilding it. But um, I mean, the World Cup had a big uh, influence on, on a lot of rebuilding around uh, yeah, around the yeah, city, with roads and new hotels. But yeah, it has been restored very much to the uh, you know the wide boulevards, big squares, beautiful walks along the the river embankments and parks, and yeah, it is a nice. Uh, it is and, a nice city. And, you know, I, I I must stress, folks, I've never been to Russia, and uh, you know, I did that. We did a test uh, run through of this last week with Mikhail and Paul, and. You know, I was just blown away by the scale and the size of the Russian monuments. You know, I'm used to Normandy where people put up a one foot by six inch bronze plaque on the side of a building. Yeah. And in Russia, everything is, as you would expect, huge. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Mikhail talk in a second because it's his city and he's, you know, he's born and bred in Volgograd. So, um, Mikhail, where, where are we now? And obviously that's a statue of Lenin, but um, explain a bit about what the, the where we are and where you're walking us through. Mikhail, your mic, I, 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 I muted you, Mike. Um, you, you've got to unmute yourself. But yeah, that's um, that's Lenin there. Yeah, it's basically it's one of the statues of Lenin in uh, So we're actually in 9th of January Square at the moment. Um, I'll put the uh, photo up again so we can get an idea yeah, of where we are. Yeah, we're looking back at the, the, the sort of memorial to Papa. Just very quickly, I don't know whether we can get Mikhail. Yeah, that's a great shot there. So we're so Mikhail's actually in the area now where sort of the little yellow uh, square is. Yeah, about there, yeah, isn't he, it? Yeah. yeah, he's out in that area now, which is where the Lenin statue is. Uh, yeah, Pavlov's house really came back. It came about as Yakov Pavlov uh, was uh, was ordered to do a reconnaissance from the area of the mill into the house. Uh, now, depending on which source you use, there was uh, well, there was four or six men went with him, and effectively they got into the house. There's various stories about civilians being in the house and told them where the Germans were, um, or that Pavlov's account is that he, he actually uh, he came he, he he basically found the Germans in the house. It, it, unbelievably, the Germans then in my when you talk so close the front lines together, the Germans have to the sentries out, but. Uh, Anyway, Pavlov and his small group using grenades and uh, handheld weapons cleared the Germans out of the house. Over the next couple of days, more reinforcements were moved in uh, and they occupied and fortified the house. Barbed wire around it, laid minefields, knocked the, uh, the holes in between the walls, occupied all the floors. And uh, basically, it then began yeah, a fifth, what became a 58-day siege right up to the end of the battle, where Pavlov and uh, uh, a lieutenant called Afanayev um, held Pavlov's house. And it, it become this symbol in many ways of the resistance of the Russian troops 
in Stalingrad. Now, over that period, they, uh, there were numerous German assaults uh, into the building to try and capture the building. Um, what some of the great accounts actually, which which came, uh, to give you an indication, a lot of people know about Zeitzer, the silly Zeitzer, the famous yeah, sniper yeah. from the 284 Rifle Division. This is this is all part of the, the Pavlov House Memorial. This is like the far end of the uh, uh, on the square part of the memorial. Um, but uh, one of the things Pavlov describes, and it's certainly something if you if you read a lot of the German accounts, it was a major problem for the Germans. Was actually the, the cult of the sniper wasn't just about riflemen. It actually encompassed mortar men. But in particular, it encompassed the, the guys who used the 14.5 Russian anti-tank rifle. The German tanks of that period, you know, they weren't the later better armed and armoured Tigers and Panthers. They were the Panzer 3s, Panzer 4s, and obviously the Sturmgeschutz that we're talking about. Where the armour was a lot less, so they made them vulnerable particularly around the commanders to fall at the poor and the turret area to Soviet anti-tank rifle. And there's numerous German accounts of the casualties from the use of the, the, the rounds either penetrating into the, the tops of the turrets, which are obviously less, uh, less well armoured, or into the cupola areas, causing serious casualties, particularly the tank commanders. So uh, Pavlov's account is basically what they did was they got the anti-tank rifle then on the roof of the building. So they could fire down onto the vulnerable area of the German tank, uh, the German Sturmgeschutz, causing casualties. And of course, the, the actual German tanks are guns, because of course, German tanks were being committed into the fighting in the factory district. 14th Panzer Division, 24th Panzer Division were sucked into there, which again had an impact on the actual Uranus, because there was very few German counterattack mobile forces to actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, counterattack the Russian thrust, but the uh, the Germans a significant amount of German casualties got so, and basically the, the guns couldn't elevate high enough to obviously be hit the uh, the uh, uh, the top floors of the building. So the Soviet riflemen up there had a, they basically had a field day taking out German uh, tank commanders. And so, yeah, the cut of the sniper wasn't all just about well, riflemen. I think that's a very good point because you know when we talk about anything like gives our snipers it's not just them it's about the doctrine of how an army fights and even pavlov himself being kind of part of a scouting you that we don't really have a comparable thing in the british army in the american army they 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 fight in a different way and and that's it's the whole doctrine that goes in around mm. it yeah, the, the use of rockets the use of mortars the machine guns the submachine guns that yeah so there's a whole approach to it but you are very correct about pavlov and there's a for those watching there's a russian made movie called stalingrad not the german one from 1993 but the russian one from 2013 that that has a fictionalized version of Pavlov's house without actually having it been named Pavlov. But the thing is, the legend is it wasn't just Pavlov's men. There were odd na Navy infantry yeah, there and spotters. Yeah. They became this kind of example of there was a Russian from every part of the country there. There were old guys and young guys and women and, and veterans and newbies. And they kind of bonded together in this house and held on for this epic siege. And some of that is true. And some of it is kind of the legend. I'll ask, in fact, I'll ask Mikhail because he's standing there. So to you, Mikhail, as a, as a, as a young Russian from, from Volgograd, what does, what does Pavlov's house represent to you? Uh, Pavlov's house represents, uh, first of all, uh, the heroism of defenders of Stalingrad. And uh, it symbolizes uh, all of the houses which were uh, defended uh, dur uh, during the, the defense of the city. And... Uh, uh, they decided to leave uh, one of such houses as a memorial and uh, uh, tell uh, the story of defense of the city. So uh, we have to understand that uh, this is not, uh, it, it was not the only one uh, such uh, fortress in the city. There, were new, uh, there was a, new, uh, a lot of such uh, yeah. houses. We, we had, uh, for example, uh, by the same... Uh, house, uh, the house of uh, Zavalotny, which was uh, just in the uh, 50 meters from the Pavlov's mm. house. Uh, we had uh, the uh, uh, the grain elevator uh, in the southern part of the city, which was also like uh, 
fortress, uh, one of the fortresses of Stalingrad. We had uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Commissar House, or P-shaped building, uh, the L-shell, L-shaped building uh, by the Pavlov's house. Uh, we uh, had uh, the Milk House, which was in the Germans' ha- hands, uh, which was a German fortress in Stalingrad, which was uh, right in front of the uh, Pavlov's house. Later, after Pavlo- uh, uh, the defenders of the Pavlov's house uh, uh, had to uh, retake this uh, milk house. The uh, names uh, to the houses uh, were given uh, uh, not uh, by the uh, 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 numbers of, of the streets. They were just given, uh, for example, milk house. It was uh, uh, the color of the milk. The, yeah. the mm, uh, mm. Pavlov's house uh, received the name of Pavlov because uh, Pavlov uh, was one of the first uh, who reached that house uh, in uh, uh, the middle of uh, September and uh, 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 was uh, hold, holding it until the group of Afan- Afanasyev uh, arrived. But yeah, here's, they... here's another question for you, Mikhail, because I'm, I'm yeah. interested in this. We have in all the battles we talk about that the people who know about them and there's people who think they know about them. For, for, for you, who obviously you've studied the battle, you've been to the archives, you've read the accounts, you've read the histories, you looked at the stuff. Are you finding that the popular idea of what happened in Volgograd is kind of getting a bit confused over the years? And people you speak to, other Russians, they think they kind of know the story, but they kind of know the the, the fictitious version of the story? Is it, is it harder to get people to understand the real history these days? Uh, no, people, uh, 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 they, uh, they, they absolutely uh, realize what was happening here. They don't forget about the history. So the stories uh, uh, go from, fam- uh, from generation to generations. Yeah. Uh, so okay. I think... Uh, uh, people uh, don't forget about the history, and uh, uh, they try to uh, to to tell their children uh, more and more. So yeah, uh, good. yeah. So especially here, living in in Stalingrad, uh, you can't forget about that. Uh, no, uh, that history, yes, because so it is on the every step, yeah. So, mm. so Paul, when we get to the end of this siege, what was what what was the conclusion to the events in this particular area where we are now, around the square, around Pavlov's house? Because you know, you said it was a siege of what was it, sixty days or something? Yeah, so, yeah. well, you see various quotes, fifty-eight today. It started basically they, they started on the twenty-seventh of September, and in fact, right. this uh, this area of uh, the city, troop, German troops were pushed back into this area so um yeah it really went on to the end of the, the, the end of the battle uh, and german troops began to obviously surrender to the russian troops in this area um and the battle moves a little bit to the north doesn't it the final kind of hold out the germans is a bit yeah, a bit further. yeah. I'll, I'll show that map again so because it yeah um so, so we are currently in the area around with, with the power plant, but it moved up. Correct me if I'm wrong. It kind of moved up near the tractor factory up here to the north. The final moment. Yeah, the- yeah. I mean, what, what happened? This, this sector of the front actually, in some ways, became a relatively quiet sector compared to the areas further north. You can see the Mummy of uh, Hill, the Mummy of Kurgan, and up at the factory, the factory district. <coughs> Excuse me. From late September and into the main German offensive in October, they concentrated most of their troops in more into that northern area. And I say this, this area in the city centre, actually, 71st Infantry Division, 295th Division, remains in those areas until the surrender at the beginning of, uh, mm. of the, the final surrender at the end of the began surrendering, obviously, throughout late uh, January. Uh, various groups. Uh, well, after the pocket was split into uh, into two areas, the central area and then the northern area. But like I said, it's quite a, quite a, a there was obviously heavy fighting going on, but not as heavy as, as what was actually taking place 
uh, further north. Yeah, and I think that map also shows just how how large a city Volgograd is as well. Yeah. The northern part up there, right down there, we're talking quite a few miles. It's not it's not a little village like we get. Oh no, 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 it's, it's, it's a, a, bit, it's a long stretch. Uh, uh, it was a long, thin, thin city along the banks of the Volga. It's, it's expanded now. I mean, it might uh, obviously give a, a better impression of how the city's uh, grown westwards. Yeah. Um, Oh, he's just coming up to the mass grave now. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. The, yeah, no, that's a very important troops, bit. I'll... The troops were basically from both sides were basically in the, from the 27th of September, roughly until the final surrenders of the German troops in the city centre areas. Um, they they were there in a pretty much static position up till up to that 58, 60 day period. The uh, I mean the interesting thing about Pavlov's house, well, I think mean, he, he sort of touched on it, was that. Um, there are that many different accounts. I mean, you've got various books, and I'm talking about books in the, in the English language, uh, you know, Beaver's book, Michael Jones's book, Glance's yeah, books, yeah. which all give separate numbers of the amount of troops that were involved in Pavlov's, the defence of Pavlov's house. Like, like you've touched on the nationalities. Um, I mean, a lot a lot of the Minsk uh, Commission report, uh, which was then beefed up by the Soviet authorities after the war, um, yeah, so it's uh, it, it's like Mikhail. Mikhail made a good point. It, it, it stands as a as a symbol of so many defensive positions. Yeah, but as in many many things with military history, the uh, the actual facts of who was there, when they were there, how many were there, is quite hard to actually uh, uh, ascertain. Because, in a sense, in a sense, doesn't matter. It, I mean, it, 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 it matters to us because we want to know the details. But yes, when you're looking exactly. at the symbolism of the defense yeah. of the city, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to ask Mikhail now, because this is one of the and there, there were quite a few of these in the city. So this is one of the mass graves, Mikhail. So tell us about how, you know, because we, we, those watching this show, there a lot of them are used to places like Normandy and the Ardennes, where there are cemeteries where you can go to. That's not quite the situation there. So how, explain how these these mass graves work. Uh, so uh, around uh, in the city we have uh, hundreds of uh, such mass graves uh, uh, like this, uh, for example, uh, where buried 1500 uh, Russian soldiers who died uh, here during the Battle of Stalingrad during the defense of exactly this place. Here, for example, for, for example, we can read. Uh, uh, let's read what is uh, written here. Uh, here uh, buried the soldiers of the 13th Guards Rifle Division and so soldiers of the forces of NKVD fallen during the fightings for Stalingrad. Uh, when the Battle of Stalingrad finished uh, on the 2nd of February, it was quite cold uh, and uh, uh, the spring was uh, uh, coming and uh, we are afraid of uh, uh, diseases. That's why uh, all of the uh, dead bodies had to be buried uh, uh, as uh, fast as possible. So uh, civilians and uh, uh, soldiers were forced uh, to collect the dead bodies around the, in the city and bring them uh, uh, to one, uh, yeah, to different places. Yeah. So, uh, even uh, uh, children, women, and uh, old people had to collect uh, uh, bodies uh, uh, and bring them to exact places which were marked by the special services of uh, NKVD. Uh, uh -huh. in, in March, in March, for example, uh, 1943, uh, on the level of the city was issued special order and uh, uh, saying that. Uh, uh, all uh, women, children, and old people who, who could work, they they could uh, they uh, they uh, should uh, collect the bodies. And uh, for example, uh, uh, the men had uh, all men had to collect uh, uh, a day from 20 to 30 bodies a day. Women 20, 25 bodies a day. Ch uh, children. Uh, teenagers, uh, 10, uh, 15 bodies a day. You, ca you can imagine what was uh, happening in Stalingrad and uh, uh, the scale of those uh, fightings, uh, that uh, the bodies were uh, everywhere. So uh, closer to the April, uh, 
uh, yeah, uh, may the, these works were done in the city. Uh, for example, outside of the city, uh, the bodies uh, were just uh, bulldozed over in the trenches in the fox holes where the so uh, Russian soldiers uh, died defending the city. They're still there, and uh, yeah, every year. Uh, special excavation uh, teams looking for the remains of uh, Russian soldiers to uh, uh, to identify them and uh, to uh, for proper uh, reburial. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I mean, it's the way you said there that that particular grave had about 1500 bodies in it. Yes. And there are hundreds of them in the city. I think people watching this were used to the cemetery sizes in Normandy and the Ardennes. It's blown mm. away by this. And it's, you know, that again, like Paul said, the number of casualties in somewhere like Stalingrad is debated, but it's con generally considered that a million people lost their lives in the city at uh, Russian. Yeah, German, definitely. Uh, and, and which is staggering. I mean, that is, that is, I mean, we're talking for the Normandy battlefield. We're talking a total casualty rate of, I don't know, about a hundred thousand maybe killed in the Normandy campaign. A uh, few more, including civilians. And this mm. is 10 times that in one city in Russia. I think it brings it home the, the absolute scale of this battle. Um, yeah, we say here that uh, the casualties from uh, both sides uh, uh, nearly uh, two million, uh, two million people with killed and wounded. Killed and but, wounded, uh, yeah. At, yeah, at least uh, uh, about one million uh, killed. And uh, also, for, a, yeah. a much higher percentage of killed. You know, when in, in Normandy, I, I always refer to it because I'm in Normandy. Normally, in a battle in Normandy, for every one killed, you have maybe three, four, five, even mm. six wounded. In the yes. Russian campaign, it seems to be more equal. Perhaps Paul can bring in on that. You know, the because of the the cold and the the distances and the and less medical attention. I get the number of wounded who died clearly is 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 higher there, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, yes. very very much so. I mean, I, I think. It, it, a lot of it, I think you alluded to it there, Paul, you know, there's, there were certain circumstances, the vastness of, uh, of the combat, um, the vastness of the battle areas, particularly if, particularly if you were on the defensive. Uh, and, of course, the other, the other thing, you know, which we will not sort of go into today, but um, was there wasn't the uh, Geneva Convention in play. Yeah, the savagery. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, I mean, there are obviously numerous uh, accounts of casualties being looked after, you know, the, the normal things that you'd expect on the, on the battlefield once the fighting had passed on, but of course we know uh, the Eastern Front was a no-holds-barred contest. Yeah. Uh, and uh, certainly the shooting of prisoners, the shooting of wounded by both sides was entirely commonplace. And, uh, yeah, so there's no doubt about, you know, um, a lot of it came down to fatalities. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing nice about the battlefield. It's... Um, it's nice to have uh, the sort of medical uh, facilities and the humanity from both sides, and but it was a you know a, 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 uh, luckily in the West due most of the Western campaign, although we did uh, have atrocities and what have you. Generally, the wounded or prisoner of war generally were looked after. Where of course in the East it was completely different. And you're, and you're right, Paul. I think I mean, probably your ratio of actually people killed will be a lot higher, but that would, that would certainly be a factor in it that uh, many, well, millions, effectively, of prisoners and wounded guys would have uh, either received no treatment or just been dispatched. Yeah, we're just coming up to... I'll leave it to, to our, our, probably our last part of the day now, uh, the, this yeah. show. So this is one of the, um, the, the, the many um, tank turret stone memorials there, T-34s used. So... Um, where we were discussing in our in our pre-show whether whether Baston had the idea first or Stalingrad <laughs> did, I don't know. But the tank turrets on monuments. But Mikhail, explain what that says there. Uh, uh, this is one of uh, the 17 tank turrets which mark the front line of uh, defense of uh, the city uh, in the city. Yeah. yeah. For example, here written uh, is. Uh, he went the front line of defense of the uh, defense of the forces of the Stalingrad front in September, November 1942. So uh, look, all of the uh, tank turrets they point in uh, to the German positions, which were uh, just in a few hundred meters uh, uh, from here, roughly mm. on the other side of the uh, Lenin's Avenue. 
uh, on the opposite side. For example, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the officer's house uh, standing on the place where was standing the milk house, which was in the German hands uh, 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 till the uh, uh, November 1940, 1942. Yeah, mm. but uh, behind uh, we can see uh, the, uh, the Russian positions. And if you look uh, that uh, on the tank turrets, uh, that the tent turret is staying on the same line with Paulo's house, which was also the part of the uh, defense of uh, mm. Stalingrad. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, uh, all of the tank turrets were taken uh, from the real combat T thirty four tanks, uh, which were uh, destroyed during the uh, battle, and you can see the real uh, battle damages on the armor of these uh, tanks, uh, you can see the shell holes. Uh, so uh, we have uh, 17 uh, such tank towers, as I already said, uh, uh, spread on the distance of the 30 kilometers of the Stalingrad front in the city. The length of the uh, city today, of the city of Volgograd, is uh, almost 100 kilometers long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. Uh, you yeah, hear that, folks? The city is nearly a hundred kilometers long. I mean, it's, yeah, this it's, is it's one one of the, one of the longest uh, city of the world and uh, the longest uh, city of uh, uh, modern Russia. Yeah, today. which is why, folks, we really want to bring you more of these shows. This is these two we've done today are very much the uh, the beginning of this. We've got Paul who can talk about other battles there. Mikhail clearly knows his stuff. Um, we we just want to test the water with this really and and, and show you a bit of Russia. And um, and we we'll come back and do more. And so for that, we're going to bring things to an end in a minute. But for those watching, again, not only I draw your attention to my own Patreon page, but also um, because Mikhail is out there, it's pretty cold. And if you want to send uh, send me an email, I so said we can send Mikhail a few euros as a donation to get himself some fuel money because it's freezing cold out there. His hands <laughs> are cold. We can pass. I'm definitely going to buy him a stabilizer for his phone for the next show. Um, and if you are ever planning to go to Russia, of course, you. Know, you with a city of that enormity, you need to have a guide there. You, you need someone. So either book someone like Mikhail there in, or in country or go with a company like Ledger and, and someone like Paul who can do all the, the whole work for you on a bus trip and what have you. But yeah, it's a battlefield that you need someone to explain the city, the, the, the details to you. So this has been a really good stuff, you guys. I'm, I'm very, very grateful. You so Mikhail, put the, put the, turn the camera on yourself so we can say hello and say thank you again. And, uh, uh, anything else you want to show? Oh, I think we're going. I think we'll go and let Mikhail have something to eat. Um, so that was really good, folks. Um, anything you want to say, Paul? Anything you want to add to that or Mikhail? Uh, thank um, you for everyone for being with us uh, in Stalingrad. And uh, we are waiting on, uh, uh, we're waiting, waiting for you all on our next shows. Yeah, we will uh, be streaming from uh, different uh, uh, interesting places and uh, uh, we show sure that you will enjoy uh, these uh, ne uh, these uh, shows and uh, our stories. Yeah, and and remember, folks, Mikhail's doing this in his second language, uh, in the freezing cold, yeah. live on site. Me and Paul, we're just sitting in our comfy houses <laughs> talking. It's easy for us. Mikhail's got the tough job today, so fantastic job. You're a, you're a superstar, um, uh, yeah. and we really appreciate what you've done. So, um, people have yeah, enjoyed well, it. I think it's got, I've got to say, I think it's been uh, great. And thank you to Mikhail uh, out on the ground. Um, if you do, you know, if, uh, as Paul said, if you want to go in a, uh, on your own to Stalingrad, you can come to obviously go through Mikhail. But I will say that if you do come with Ledger, and this is a bit of a shameless plug, you do get us both because Mikhail and I do work together. Um, that's and, a good point. Yeah, that's so, how so they know so each yeah, other. So you, you, yeah. you do get us both on that. Um, and obviously, that's for a slightly bigger group. But yes, so many yeah. sights to see, everybody. It's, it, it really is the most fascinating battlefield. And Russia is, if you haven't been, is the most fascinating uh, yeah. country. Uh, and, and in addition uh, to the live shows, TV. the live streams, we also we've got a panel discussion coming up with with, a, with Ian Garner, who's writing a book about the media coverage of starting up. I'm still trying to get someone else Russian to be involved in that, and hopefully someone German. I'm still working on that, but we want to have a more of a discussion about how Stalingrad sits in the in the grand scheme of things, the hubris of Hitler and Stalin both wanting to fight for it. But that's for. A, that's for a panel discussion rather than these live streams. The live streams, you know what we'll do. We'll take it to battlefield. So anyway, 
that's it folks We're, yeah. we'll see you all Being again great. soon so um thank you for watching i'll end the stream now don't forget tomorrow uh, we've got another live stream it's midday uk time from the uh the netherlands with edwin and yoris about Operation Pegasus 1. We will also touch on Operation Pegasus 2. That is the rescue of some of the survivors of the Battle of Arnhem by the 101st Airborne Elements of Dutch Resistance. That'll be Edwin and Joris. They've worked on that really hard. So hopefully the weather, the weather will be good for that. So that's another one for tomorrow. We will do live streams again from Normandy when we're allowed out after lockdown. Who knows when that will be? But lots of shows <laughs> coming up. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mikhail. I'll see You're you all welcome. again soon. This is Paul Budaj. Don't forget to check out the Patreon page. Don't forget to click subscribe and don't forget to go and check out Mikhail's website so you can see some of his videos of the battlefield inside the flour mill. So I'm ending now. Thank you very much. See you all tomorrow. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.